Welcome to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I'm Tammy Mack. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fox Soul. Yes. So over the last couple of years, at least, at the least, the very least, there has been a rapid increase in racial division, economic upheaval, and toxicity in America and its politics. And as America seeks relief and looks toward strong leadership, many people question if President Joe Biden is the right president to bring America together. Or is America in danger under the administration of Joe Biden? The business of being black today is our president, Joe Biden. Is he America's president or not? Nah? Please welcome Republican politician, the Honorable Mike Hill. Hi. Hi, Tammy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. The Director of Communications for the Hip Hop Caucus, Joseph Pate, is with us. Hi, Joseph. Hi, Tammy. Thank you for having me. Strategist and former State Senator Katrina Robinson on deck. Hi, Senator Katrina. Hi, Tammy. How are you? Fine. You know, now that we've got this Hurricane Inn happening in Florida, I'm sure nobody can think of your name without thinking about Hurricane Katrina right now, right? Absolutely. For the past 17 years. Oh, okay. You've been getting it. Got it. An educational leader and activist, Dr. Zachary Kirk. Hi, Dr. Kirk. How are you doing, my friend? Great to be here. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have you on the show. So the first question I always ask is pretty traditional, and that is why should black people care? This is, after all, the business of being black. So, Dr. Kirk, why should black people care if Joseph Biden, or if President Joe Biden, is the president that can bring us together? Because he is all of our president. We are all participants, black, brown, and otherwise, of this democracy. And it's our responsibility to uphold it, to hold those that we elect to power accountable, but to also participate, to be civically engaged, and to be informed. So that's why everybody, regardless of your color, your belief system, or your creed, religion, should be heavily invested in the work that President Biden is doing, whether it's good or not. Like, whether we agree with him or not, we need to know what he's doing, hold him accountable, and be ready to do our part to ensure American democracy continues. Got it. Katrina, why should Black people care about how good or bad Joe Biden is? Black people should care because we are always the most affected. Um, President Biden was elected basically on the heels of us trying to save American democracy and, and, and usually in every instance and in every issue that comes um, to light, it's usually the black people that are most affected. Now, we shouldn't be the only ones to care, but we should care more than we have been showing. Oh, wow. We're going to certainly circle back to that because you say we should care more than we have been showing. Mike Hill, please talk to us. Why should black people care if President Joe Biden is good for America or not? We should care because this is our country. This is my nation. This is where I was born and raised. This is where my parents were born and raised. So if I have any concern about our nation, I'm going to be concerned about who's leading it. And I would like to add that we are not a democracy. We are a republic. The difference between the two is a democracy says that majority rules. A republic says that the majority rules as long as it's within the framework of the rule of law. That is a big distinction. That way, the minority population, whether I'm not talking about color, I'm talking about uh, in a, any certain circumstance, the minority population will always have a voice because it's done within the constraints of the rule of law. That's what a republic is. And so we must govern ourselves as a republic and make sure that our leaders operate within the framework of the rule of law. All right, we've got a whole hour to cover. We'll certainly get to that. Joseph, why should black people care if President Joe Biden is a danger to America or bringing us together? Black people should care because our government is a reflection of us. You know, governments should be of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it's up to us to be able to say that here's what's important in our communities, here's what we need. And as our elected leaders, we expect that you can follow through, create the policies and solutions that actually make people safe and able, able to thrive. So on that note, is America headed for danger? 
You know, I think that with President Biden as our leader, we've had a lot of big wins um, with his presidency. We've seen the rollout of COVID vaccines and booster shots, which have reduced uh, COVID cases and deaths. We've seen with the Inflation Reduction Act, the largest climate investment in U.S. history. It also includes provisions for uh, Medicaid to lower prescription drug prices for folks. And we've seen uh, increased job creation, lower employment rates, unemployment rates. And so I think all of those things are positive. Um, in general, no presidency is going to be perfect. But certainly, uh, I think Biden has been able to push forth some provisions that directly impact Black, Brown, and Indigenous folks. And uh, those are the results that we're seeing. Mike, are we headed for a disaster? We are headed for a disaster. And the reason I say that is because our economy is in very precarious situation right now. Inflation is going through the roof. Unemployment is higher than it's been in a long time. And the government is spending way too much money. There is going to be a collapse in the housing market and in other markets because of how government is out of control spending money right now. Our national debt is over $30 trillion. And our unfunded liabilities is three times that in the trillions. And we can't even pay it back. Our economy is headed for going off the cliff. We are headed for a disaster. It certainly makes me feel better about being in debt. Uh, Dr. Hick, Dr. Kirk, I'm sorry. Dr. <laughs> Kirk, is America headed for disaster? Our democracy is absolutely, our nation is not headed for a disaster from the work of the Biden administration, our congressional Democrats. Now, are we in danger? Yes. Are there things that we have to do to help continue to steer the ship? Absolutely. But are we in danger? I mean, are we headed for a disaster? No, nah, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I definitely have to give credit to uh, Mike for, for that statement. And some of the, the predictive doom and gloom just shared may very well come to pass. But if our nation continues to follow the leadership of President Biden, I think that we're going to be in good shape. A lot depends on these 2022 midterms happening in less than 40 days. A whole lot is going to depend on who continues to control our Senate and who continues to set the pace for our nation. And yes, this democracy will continue. And again, my yep, it, we are a republic according to some, but according to founding fathers, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, the Phillips Papers, they would have instead said not necessarily a republic or even a democracy giving you credit, but they would have called us a representative democracy. So I just wanted to kind of fact check that and put that out there as well, because it just depends on the semantics and the words they use. But again, I like to see America or kind of determinants or say my country is a democracy because I believe that my voice matters and that too of other black people. Katrina, are we in danger, girl? In the words of Whoopi Goldberg. We in danger, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I will say President Biden has made some huge strides, of course, uh, in policy, uh, you know, whether it has to do with infrastructure, climate crisis, or even education uh, during these first two years. However, at the same time, we are experiencing some uh, movement um, post-Trump that is further devising America. So we have an issue not only amongst the people, but amongst governing. I think we talked last time about the difference between campaigning and governing. And pre President Biden does a great job in saying the right things that resonate with the right people. However, the action is lacking. I mean, we have such a disconnect between our federal and state governments, whether it's gun laws, reproductive laws, voting laws. There's so much disconnect that there's so much room for um, discord. And I think that's what puts us in a predicament right now. And as uh, Mr. Hill did say, we, I mean, we are in a, a, a very, very, very critical time with our economy. However, we all know that cyclical in nature is nothing different than what we experienced in 2008. So it's something that's going to rebound. However, it's going to be very telling what this administration does in preparation for that. When you talk about campaigning and actually governing, uh, you make a huge point that there is a difference there. Uh, do you all think that Joe Biden won because nobody wanted Trump to win? Or Absolutely. should I say that the other way? Did Joe Biden win because people wanted Trump to lose? I will go ahead and answer that for uh, the panel. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think that that has been um, pretty much the the 
the sentiment throughout his his presidency is that we're looking for something different than what was happening under Trump's administration. We want the government to handle Trump. I mean, this is the first time we've ever had to deal with, should we arrest an ex-president? Should we arrest an ex-president? I was talking to a friend the other day. I said, I couldn't believe that I am living in a country amongst people who actually elected this man as president. And I think that was the sentiment of a lot of people when they went to the voting polls uh, to vote for President Biden. It was it was the the lesser of two evils. But I want to say to that, be, the reason Trump won was because we wanted something different. So but then the reason he lost was because we wanted something different. But is Joe Biden really different than what we were looking for before Trump won. Are you guys with me on that? Because that's yeah, a hard Tammy, question. Absolutely. Absolutely right. And so just to kind of add in to what, you know, Katrina said, right? I, I agree with you, Katrina. I think many people voted for President Biden, the 7 million more, a large part of them, because they wanted something different. But I also want to kind of add in and giving credit to President Biden is that he actually, he himself ran because he felt as though he was the only person who could beat Donald Trump in the election. This man had a storied, historic career of service to the American people as a senator. He had already made history as the as, as vice president of our United States of America under the very first black president, you know, that we elected, President Barack Hussein Obama. So he had already done his work. He had already done his time. He had already. Hold that thought. Let me do my work and go to a commercial break real quick. Welcome back to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I'm Tammy Mack. And the business of being black today is. Are President Joe Biden a danger to America or can he bring us together? We left off with you, Dr. Kirk. And that's exactly why Joseph Robinette Biden is our president. He ran on a campaign to bring us together. He spent the entire first year of his administration trying desperately hard to build coalition with Republicans in Congress, not making a lot of progress, losing the support of a number of moderates, cinema and mansion, and then losing the, 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 a huge portion of the base, the progressives, uh, in that work. So I think that, yeah, he's doing the work that he ran on, and that's why he's president. Whether or not he's going to be successful at it, only time tells. A lot will be riding again on these 2020 to midterms. But still half of America is in discourse. Uh, Joseph? Yeah, I mean, I think what's really important here is is understanding, too, again, the, the electoral power that we have and the right to vote. I think that is where, where a lot of real change will happen. And when we talk about Biden and his leadership, I think, <clears throat> of course, whether you look at it, there are things that can be improved, there are things that he's done well. But when we talk about the changes that we want to see in our communities, when we talk about things that will actually impact Black folks, low-income folks, it's going to be the action that we can take at the poll. And the biggest threat that I see to our democracy in terms of doing that are all of the restrictions that are popping up in place in terms of limiting people's access, in terms of gerrymandering, and making it difficult for people to vote, which that should be easy, and it's not. Uh, Mike, uh, House Representative, or rather House Republican, leader Kevin McCarthy accused President Joe Biden of being divisive and blamed Democrats for rising inflation, crime, and government spending. McCarthy said in the past two years, Joe Biden has launched an assault on the soul of America, on its people, on its laws, on its most sacred values. He has launched an assault on our democracy. His policies have severely wounded America's soul, diminished America's spirit, and betrayed America's trust. Do we agree with this? I agree with that, except for one phrase that he said there. He said that he is destroying our democracy. I must again point out we are not a democracy we're not a representative democracy, Dr. Kirk. I'm sorry to have to correct you there. We are a republic. That's why when we say I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Being a republic is the first, I won't say the first time, but it was the first in a long time since the uh, Roman Empire that a republic was set up. And the whole idea is you must follow the rule of law. And what I see happening with uh, President Biden right now is he is not necessarily following the rule of law. The rule of law says we should have a secure border. We don't. And since he has come into office, I've heard numbers as high as 5 million illegal aliens have entered this country. 
And what that causes is a disruption to our economy, to those uh, communities where the illegal aliens are coming into. I don't think we now, refer to them as illegal aliens anymore, Mike. But they are. What else would I, you call I think them? it would be immigrants. They're not immigrants. Immigrants come in legally. You come in properly. When you just walk across the border, that makes you an alien. An alien is not a bad term. It simply means that you're a foreigner to this nation. And when you come across illegally, it looks more like an invasion. When you have 5 million people since Biden has come into office invading our nation, that is going to have an impact. So let's talk about this republic way. you're talking about, Mike. Why are you the only one that considers America a republic? I, I Listen, when you r repeat uh, <laughs> our anthem, right, I, I say he's right. And to the republic for which it stands, he, he's right. How can we possibly disagree with that, Katrina, Dr. Kirk? <laughs> I, I disagree with a lot that Mike has said, actually. Um, when we talk about presidents who don't respect the rule of law, I, I, I'm sorry, but Joe Biden is not the first one that comes to mind for me. Um, we have a, we have quite a bit um, to work against. You know, being that Joe Biden has enjoyed such a long um, career in politics and a career in governing, he has become sort of an institutionalist. And these very institutions are the things that are holding us in the framework that we are in now, whether we're talking about the Supreme Court that is that he's failed to stack since he's been in the office, whether we're talking about um, our criminal justice system as a whole, there are so many different holes that have been created under the prior presidency that Joe Biden has to address to where we can get to where we need to be in order to address the overall lack of faith in the democracy in America. Joseph, and to the Republic, for which it stands. To, to that point and to what Mike was saying, I think the bigger concern here when we talk about the rule of law and following that and the constraints of a republic or democracy, we're forgetting to acknowledge the insurrectionists and the activity that has taken place with both within the government and within within the people um, and attempts to, to overturn it based off of the election not going their way. I think that there's a lot to look at when we think about what the real threats are to our democracy, when we talk about uh, white supremacy and anti-Black racism, when we talk about homophobia, xenophobia, transphobia, misogyny, those are things that I think are actually larger threats to our democracy or what we might call a republic instead of Joe Biden and, and simplifying it in that way. Dr. Kirk, is it a matter of semantics when we talk about Republican democracy? Personally, I think that it absolutely is a matter of semantics. And I just want to go back and we talk about, you know, because I'm all about like not sharing misinformation or disinformation. When you talk about the borders, we absolutely have a border crisis, and I want to give credit, cred credence to that. But when you talk about who's doing something about it, President Biden's administration has had more migrants detained and given due and just process than the previous president. And that's an actual fact that can be proven, oh, and, and that's right there. In addition, previous leadership talked about building a wall, use that as a massive fundraising strategy, yet there is no wall that has been truly built at the border. Also, previous administration talks about getting Mexico to pay for that wall. That also didn't happen. However, the Biden administration secured $1.5 million in the effort to help support migrants who came over to this nation. So I just want to set, just kind of share those facts with your audience, Tammy, just so that everyone, again, that we have those facts. But again, to me, it's a matter of semantics. And, the, and it's a matter that I would argue again, when we say that we're a republic, it's setting up a whole entire federalist argument to de- legitimize the value of democracy, to make people feel as though their vote doesn't matter, to, 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 to reinforce the effort that, you know, you don't have any control because it's about this group of people in this uh, republic controlling the situation. That's not what we are. We're not the, uh, the what, what was Darth Vader's people? We're not the evil empire. We're, we're, we're America. Mike? That hardly made any sense to me at all, trying to explain the difference between a democracy and a republic. I try to keep it very simple. A democracy says that majority rules, which can be so wrong because the majority can vote to do something that is illegal. But if they have to follow the rule of law, the law says you can't do that, then whatever they vote for cannot be legitimized. 
It cannot stand as being uh, the rule of law be simply because you voted for it. That's the difference between a democracy and a republic. A republic says that, and that's what you want. You want a republic instead of a democracy. So then the majority does not always rule. Let me give you a perfect example. In the South, after the Civil War, they enacted Jim Crow laws. That's what the majority wanted. However, it was not legitimate and it did not stand because it went against the rule of law of saying that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain God-given rights. And so those Jim Crow laws failed. They went away. They didn't go away quietly. It was with a battle, but they went away because we are a republic. If we weren't a republic, those laws could still be on the books because the majority wanted it at that time. Well, I, now that we understand the difference between a republic and a democracy for the sake of this show, uh, Mike, you are, are more than welcome to refer to America as a republic. I don't think uh, we take any fault in that at all. But back to the topic at hand, when it comes to Biden's Build Back Better plan, has he done that? Has he kept his promise to America? Katrina. It's been a total disaster. Go ahead, Mike. It's been a total disaster. Nothing has been built back better since he's, be, he's came, come into office. Name me one area that we are better off since when he has come into office. I can't name a one. All right. well, I'll name COVID. I'll name COVID. But Joseph, you name one. As I mentioned, our climate and environment, there's been tremendous progress made with that within this administration specifically. And I think that is one of our most urgent crises. So I would disagree with that strongly. The climate, what's wrong with the climate? Well, uh, <laughs> we have a ton of uh, pollution, but there's uh, environmental uh, racism, climate racism. That what's environmental racism? I don't understand that term. What is that? It just means that the way that our systems are structured, there are people that are disproportionately impacted by the harms of fossil fuel production, for example. We can How? How? Are, are you saying that Black and brown people uh, receive worse climate than anyone else? The climate changes that we're seeing, the climate crisis is absolutely fueled by pollution and what we're seeing in terms of environmental disparities. Black and brown folks are located in communities um, close to these production facilities of petrochemicals and again, close to highways. All of this has been designed and is very intentional, but these folks are living in toxic environments and we know that. We can look at Cancer Alley in Louisiana, for example. We can look at folks in the Ohio River Valley who will tell you about the asthma that they experience, the cancer, the, the poison that's in their, their water. We know that this is a fact and it has an, a detrimental impact on our people. So that's what I mean. And I think the Biden administration has taken steps towards addressing that in a way that is recognizing those racial and economic disparities. I can speak that. specifically. I can speak specifically to the settlement that Exxon's had to pay out. Um, and let's take a quick break and come back. Welcome back to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I am Tammy Mack. One thing we know for sure and could probably all agree with is, well, the inflation that's happening in America today. It's getting the best of all of us. But one way to know you are doing the right thing with your coins is to wait three weeks. Huh? What, Tammy Mack? Wait, three weeks? Why three weeks? Because that's how fast the average Scoremaster user takes to boost their credit score by an average of 61 points. And listen, 61 points added to your credit score can save you tens of thousands on everything we finance. Scoremaster technology was developed by credit data scientists to boost your credit score higher and faster than you thought possible. Scoremaster is so easy. It takes about a minute to get started and you don't have to wait months for your best credit score. How many points can you add to your credit score? Be sure to visit scoremaster.com slash B-O-B-B for the special seven day trial I have for you. That's scoremaster.com slash B-O-B-B. Again, scoremaster.com slash B-O-B-B. Scoremaster.com slash B-O-B-B. Now, if that ain't the business, I don't know what is. Business of being black returns after this.
Welcome back to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I am Tammy Mack, and the business of being black today is Joe Biden. Is he dangerous to America, or has he brought this country together? Please welcome Republican politician, the Honorable Mike Hill, the Director of Communications for the Hip Hop Caucus, Joseph Pate, strategist and former state senator, Katrina Robinson, and educational leader and activist, Dr. Zachary Kirk. I was saying before we left, because Joseph mentioned climate change and how Joe Biden has definitely worked on climate change. Mike was a little, uh, you know, it was questionable to Mike as to what Joe has done to climate change and how climate change even has affected America in the first place. Um, I do know that Exxon had to pay my family a settlement because of the asbestos problem that the chemical plant caused in our neighborhood, which was majority of black people. But let's uh, continue to answer Mike's question, which was, what has he done? Name one thing that he's done. Katrina? And we've named several things. Mike just doesn't want to hear it. That's, that's the point. Um, but I, I just want to go back to what we were talking about when we talked about environmental racism. Um, I don't, I, Mike, are you familiar with Jackson, Mississippi, Flint, Michigan? Does that sound familiar? Sure. What does that have to do with climate change? Okay, but we're talking about environmental racism. So there, there are issues where the black and brown or the underrepresented are uh, basically targeted for areas to be able to do business at the expense of their health. And when we talk about what President Biden has done to address climate crisis, you cannot talk about climate crisis without inherently talking about pollution and about environmental racism. So I just wanted to clarify that for you. Um, but we can talk about a number of things that President Biden has done under this administration, but the fact that we're still talking about our democracy being at hand is an issue for all of America, not just Black America. This is the first time in my life I've ever heard of people actually being scared of a civil war. Can you imagine in our lifetime having to endure something like that based on a prior president's division of America? This is what we're, this is what we're actually talking about today. And I think your rhetoric uh, um, during this actual session, Mike, has been basically an echo of that. No, okay, first of all, you say the talk of civil war. I didn't hear any talk of civil war when Trump was president. I didn't start hearing that until Biden has become president. And there will not be a civil war in America at this time. The reason I say that is to have a war, you must have an army on both sides, and you must have generals on both sides. We don't have that right now. When you're talking like the previous civil war, there was an army and there were generals on both sides. We don't have that. Now, are we a divided nation? Yes, we are divided. We're divided right now because of what we see happening to our nation as a whole. And I have to go back again to the invasion of what's coming across our border. That is going to be a disaster should it continue. We must stop. A nation without borders is not a nation at all. And now our nation's borders are wide open and anyone can come in and we're seeing disastrous results of that, including the death of fentanyl as the drug cartels are bringing that very dangerous drug across our borders that right now we have seen just in the past year and a half over 100,000 Americans, I don't care what your skin color is, have died of overdose of fentanyl that is coming across those borders. Now, when President Trump was there, he uh, was able to let the Chinese government know, the Chinese Communist Party know, we are not going to tolerate that. And we didn't see that, uh, the uh, amount of fentanyl coming across our border that we're seeing now. It is having disastrous results in this nation, and it must be addressed. And in fact, I read an article just last week where President Biden has very quietly started building that wall again. In critical places, he is putting up a wall. Fact check that, Dr. Kirk, is actually the truth. 
It, it's it's yeah. interesting that America never takes responsibility for a lot of its own problems uh, and we blame it on other uh, nations. I just wonder where that outrage and that energy was during the crack epidemic, but that's not what the show is about. So we'll move on. I have to agree with Mike when he says, listen, the gas prices have uh, risen. Uh, uh, let's talk about the, the price of groceries today. I mean, what has President Joe Biden done when it comes to helping our economic Economics. Tammy, if I, yep, I'm going to tell you right now, my friend, look, if we did not have money to put gas in our cars, we would not put gas in our cars. And I, too, am highly affected by the increase in prices and inflation. But when you talk about what President Biden has done, we're talking about nine million more jobs. We're talking about record unemployment at a 3.6 percent rate of Americans who are not working. The majority of Americans are working. The majority of Americans Americans are now more prosperous. Because of that, we are suffering currently from inflation. And the answer and what we're hoping for is a soft landing. But no matter what happens and trying to curb that and do artificial things to this market to bring prices down, it could possibly cost people jobs. In addition to that, with what we are going to see in this rescue plan and the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, hopefully will help mitigate some of those crisis points. The problem to me is not that President Biden has done these things, but he had to wait so long to get them done, that he had to work so hard to build consensus with Christian Cinema and Joe Manchin because he knew he couldn't count on any of his Republican counterparts in Congress to do their jobs and care about the American people. That, to me, is a problem. So when we talk about inflation, it's easy to put the blame on the Biden administration when a lot of that blame, in my opinion, relies on congressional Republicans and leadership like um, What's your good friend? My, my mind went blank from Kentucky. If I we can. all know our minority leader uh, of the Senate. Mitch McConnell. Oh, you're talking about yeah. Mitch McConnell. Yeah, some people I try so hard to just wipe from my mind by not thinking about them, but just because I don't think about them, it doesn't mean they don't exist. But look, what you have to understand is what causes inflation. Inflation is caused by too much money in the economy. And when you have a government that is spending and printing money at an astronomical rate, then there is too much money chasing too few goods. That is what causes inflation. Not because uh, uh, Biden was unable to get certain people in the Senate or the House to vote his way. In fact, he has gotten almost everything he has wanted, and it's been a disaster. Why? Because there's a majority of Democrats in the House, and it, it is equal there in the Senate, but uh, Vice President Kamala Harris can break that. So you name me one uh, issue that he has brought forward that has not passed. It, it, everything has passed, and it has been a disaster. It is, it is what has caused our inflation. Too Mike, much we only have 48 state. Democrats in the Senate. Mike, we only have 48 Democrats in the Senate and we have 50 Republicans. Bernie Sanders of Vermont and Angus King of Maine are independents. I, I, I didn't follow you. Um, I, I, I want to I want to make sure that we um, make sure our vice president's name is said correctly. It is Kamala. Not, uh, I just want to uh, make uh, show respect to her. I'm sorry. I, I, I had no disrespect intended. How did I say it? Uh, I don't even remember. <laughs> the Biden administration continues. Um, when Mike talks about this money that we're spending, uh, we can't deny it, can we? The Biden administration continues to give financial aid to Ukraine, but we have not seen the same being done for inner cities in this country. Even rapper Plies had something to say about this. He tweeted, Dear America, if we can give Ukraine and Ukrainians over $15.2 billion to fight a war, is no way in hell any Americans needing assistance after Hurricane Ian should go without. You politicians ask us for our votes, not Ukrainians. Do Biden's actions give off the impression that he isn't interested in the people who helped put him in the office, Joseph? I don't think so completely. Of course, I agree that there's always more that can be done to help 
those that are underserved and without resources in our country. I think in general, of course, as a president, there are going to be uh, national affairs to take care of as well as international affairs. But when we talk about economics and when we talk about what the Biden administration has done on that front, under the American Rescue Plan, we've had a child tax credit, which we saw the benefits of, although that program has been short-lived, we've seen the reductions in childhood poverty as a result. And that came from giving money directly to families, um, you know, families um, in a targeted way. The same thing that we're seeing with uh, the student loan debt relief. This is money that is being given back to uh, Americans, college graduates, student uh, student loan borrowers uh, in a way that's fashioned so that it's directly impacting those in the middle class um, and, and those uh, in, in lower income brackets as well. So I think when we're talking about what he's doing uh, on an economic front, there are policies that are having an impact on our communities, particularly uh, black and brown folks. Hmm. The, Some the people student say loan that... forgiveness, thank goodness, has not gone through yet, and hopefully it won't. And it does not help uh, those in lower income brackets. That student loan forgiveness was directed at high income people because That's over the true. ones with the student debt. And you just can't, you're not just giving them that money. That, that's money that has to be paid for by every single taxpayer. I don't care what your income level is. It hurts. You're talking about a child tax credit that you say was, was short-lived. Giving somebody $2,000, $3,000 one time is not going to alleviate childhood poverty. What's going to alleviate childhood poverty are good jobs for those parents who can go out and provide for their families. The government giving money away, one, is never enough, and two, it only hurts our economy because it causes inflation. And as Tammy uh, Mack pointed out, we, we see it everywhere from our, our gas to our food to uh, housing. Everything is going up in cost and it is hurting everyone. And as Katrina said, the minority communities are hurt the worst and always the first. The student loan forgiveness is based on income, so it it, it does help low income people, uh, and and is is trying to help uh, middle class as well. We certainly hope that happens, Katrina. Um, yes, I was just going to say the same thing, uh, Tammy, because most high income families can afford to send their kids to college, so most of them don't have student debt. However, you know this prior administration, when we're talking about inflation, it wasn't the Biden administration that printed the checks for stimulus uh, payouts that sent us into this whirlwind of inflation. So we're back in, in uh, a state of regulation now, but we can't blame this on the, on the present um, administration. This has been long going. And like okay, we said- so can we agree that it was government spending that is causing the inflation? You said it started with Trump, so it's government spending. You agree with that, correct? It's, it's always a factor in inflation. It is not the cause of inflation. It is a factor. It is it a Hold that thought. Factor. Let's take a quick commercial break and come back. Welcome back to The Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I'm Tammy Mack. And The Business of Being Black today is President Joe Biden. Is he a danger to America or has he brought this country together under his leadership? I want to talk specifically about black people because that's what I do, y'all. Has President Biden fulfilled any of the promises he made to black voters. Who wants to take this one? Nobody. <laughs> I think, I think uh, listen, the silence speaks volumes. Y'all sounded yeah. like y'all on Mike's side now. <laughs> he hasn't fulfilled any promises. I I'd like to hear just one. First of all, name the promise that he made and then tell me how it's been fulfilled. I'd like to hear it. So black leaders say uh, Democratic politicians court their vote, promise uh, systemic change and fail to follow through. And black issues appear to be put on the back burner. Biden warned us. Uh, well, yeah, let's just let's just start there. Have black issues been put on the back burner, Dr. Kirk? Black issues under the Biden administration have not been put on the back burner. They are always, I think, at the very forefront of this man's agenda. But action around those issues have been stalled by Republicans in Congress. The majority of 
Black people, although we are extremely diverse, as you can see from this panel discussion, we have extremely diverse viewpoints and ideas. Uh, what we want diverges, but what, we, what, what the main issues that we have cared the most about would be the George Floyd Policing Act. We care about efforts around voting, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Those two bills, both proposed and passed through a Democratic-led House of Representatives, stalled and did not go anywhere in our Congress because we could not get the 60 votes that we needed to make that happen because we can't find any Republicans to vote on these bills and vote for it in the same way we can find any Republicans to really vote on the true uh, bills that were put forth to truly help stimulate our economy and rebuild infrastructure. That's why we had scaled down packages that may make it seem as though we're not getting what we want. We're getting what we can get until these midterms are over and we truly have a real majority in Congress. Then I think that we're going to see a robust and strong next two years, not just for, uh, for the Biden administration, but also for Black people in America. All right. Uh, have, has he kept his promises, Joseph, to Black people? I agree with Dr. Kirk. I think it remains at the forefront of his agenda. And I think what we're seeing is that it's it's why this midterm election that's coming up is so important. The impasse that we're facing with uh, certain members of Congress doesn't allow some of, the thing, some of these things to advance, but it's not like they're not on the table. It's not like these conversations aren't being had. And I think people's desires, people's needs, what's most important to folks in communities is being heard, but we need that support all the way around in Congress to really move things through. What do you feel, Mike? As if we don't I know think, already. I, I think that the Black issues have been placed on the back burner. What we see that this administration is doing instead is focusing on uh, the existential, ex existential threat of climate change, which is no threat at all. And there is nothing we can do about our climate changing. It is not anthropogenic. It happens because of our distance to the sun and rotation and oscillation of the earth, which cools and warms our oceans. It has nothing to do with me going out and driving a car uh, that, that is uh, uh, fueled by gas. So no, he is not focusing on black issues. What he is instead is focusing okay. on those issues which he thinks will make him more popular, which he thinks will make the midterms more successful for those on the left, which by the way, it will not. Yeah. It's going to be a disaster for Democrats in the midterms. The Republicans are gonna be coming back with a roar. Wow. Oh, okay. Katrina? Um, I think this, this administration has seen a lot of compromise um, as it relates to Black issues. Though, you know, we campaign strongly on the things that we know that people want to hear and the things we know people want to get done, when we really understand that it, it is sometimes virtually impossible to get it done due to the makeup of our um, government. And so President Biden has experienced some stalling on some of the issues that he has promised to Black people. However, I do not think that it has been put on the back burner per se, purposely. The other part of that is, um, in the first two years, when we're getting ready for midterms, the president is, is specifically, um, I guess, leaning towards pleasing the moderate, more progressive white Democrats, where the money comes from. From, just to be honest with you. So, of course, Black issues are going to be put on the back burner because we are trying to court those who have the money to fund these elections, to fund these politicians, to fund the policy that we want to have passed. And so we are put on the back burner um, subconsciously, but I, I really do believe this administration does have a good will. However, I'm just not seeing anything that, that sways me to believe that the Black uh, population is at the forefront of his mind. So should Joe Biden take advantage of his ability to use executive orders to implement more policies to help Americans and more specifically black Americans, Dr. Kirk? There's no other option. That's all that he can do. And that's what he has been doing. We saw the executive order around policing. When you look at what he's doing to ensure that the black vote matters and the black vote counts, we see a, a recent executive order from the presidential in initiative for democratic renewal that's going to literally put large amounts of money in ensuring that your vote counts and your vote matters. That's all he can do until we get through these midterms. And yet we may have some Republicans where I hope they do so. I just hope they're doing so in favor of democracy and not against democracy like they did previously. 
So what should be the most important policy for President Biden and Congress to focus on at this time? Most Americans say it's strengthening the economy. Uh, but what do you say, Joseph? I think it's going to be protecting our voting rights. I think the right to vote is the most essential right that we have as, as Americans. And we're seeing that a lot of that is under attack, particularly in black and brown communities. We're seeing uh, polls be closed and limited with their hours. We're seeing changes to um, mail-in voting and other methods, early voting for folks that limit the ability that people have to actually let their voice be heard. So I think if there's any action that he can take now, it would be to ensure that our democracy stays strong in that sense and that folks have fair access to the polls. Mike, what do you think can be done? It fix the economy. That's what you have to do. The economy is number one. That affects everyone, black, brown, white, or whatever. I'm a small business owner. I've owned a business now for 32 years. It's an insurance and financial services agency. And I see it every day when people come in to make their premium payments. And they say, Mike, my premiums just went up. And as part of that is because of inflation. They're saying, how am I going to be able to pay this extra $30, $40 a month? And it is hurting them. We must fix the economy. And the number one way to fix the economy is to stop government spending. Allow free market capitalism to flourish because then when you have that competition, that's when more jobs are created, that's when people have more spending power, and that's when they're able to raise their families in a way that they want, not based on what we see coming out of Congress, which is forcing them to make decisions which hurt their families because they are forced to decide how they're going to spend their money, whether on food, clothing, or on housing costs. We must fix the economy. I will say this. My insurance uh, premiums have certainly gone up. Uh, yes, they car can. insurance, health insurance, uh, AFLAC, all of it. Up, up, up. I'm like, I might as well die at this point because <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> all right. So talk to me, Mike. Tell us about the organizations you're a part of. Project 21, John Birch Society, and Abolish Abortion Florida. Yes, Project 21 is a group of conservative Blacks who speak on the conservative issues uh, in our nation, or let me say it differently, from a conservative standpoint on the issues of our nation. I'm also a member of the John Burt Society. The John Burt Society was funded in 1958, and its primary purpose is to keep communism out of our government. And the more we keep communism out, the more that free market capitalism can flourish and then abolish abortion. When we look at our Declaration of Independence, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. The first one is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life is paramount. We must abolish abortion in America, protect those preborn babies in the womb. Thank you, Mike. Katrina, tell us about your book, The Ugly Truth About Pretty Lies. Oh, so my book is about, it's actually a memoir um, based on my time uh, being elected and the perils and trials that I've gone through since then. Um, but it is slated to be published and released in the spring of 2023. Nice. We love it. Joseph, the mission behind the Hip Hop Caucus, please. Hip Hop Caucus, we're a national nonprofit organization using the power of hip hop and culture to help advance uh, civil rights and human rights. Um, we are going to states across the country to bring people together to talk about the issues of selection cycle, to inform people about where they can vote and provide them resources about how to register and how to do that. Um, and we're continuing that work through the fall. Dr. Kirk, please tell us about your upcoming projects. So I'm an educator, 20 years in the field, absolutely love what I do, a uh, huge advocate and activist also on social media. My friends out there can follow me on TikTok. You can follow me. It's Zactivist on TikTok, where I am fighting hard to really educate as many people as I can around the issues, Tammy, that you talk about on your show every single episode. You can also find me on Instagram at Zactivist. And so it's just been such an honor. 
Yeah, thank you. It has certainly been an honor to have you here. Um, I want to ask you all uh, three words. Three words is all you can give me. What can Joe Biden do to bring America together? And I'll be more specific. What can Joe Biden do to heal our country? Three words. What can he do? Zachary, Dr. Kirk. Ensure democracy wins. Joseph? Listen to people, our people. That, that sounds like democracy. That sounds like the same thing. Mike, you might have a little bit more than three words here. Mike, what, what can Joe Biden do to heal our country? What can he do to heal this country? Mike? Champion the rights of the individual. That, that, I, think, I think you and Dr. Kirk and Joseph agree. I think we found some commonality here. <laughs> <laughs> Katrina, you get the last three words, sis. What can Joe Biden do to heal our country? To heal our country? Um, I'm more concerned about protecting our country. So I'm just going to say protect our elections. Okay, you're going to st st stick with the voting aspect of it, right? Yes, protect us, please. <laughs> there it is. Protect us, please. And thank you all for sharing your perspectives on Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. Thank you, Katrina, Mike, Joseph, Dr. Kirk. That is the Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack on Fox Soul. Bye, y'all. <laughs>